Spring training is here, and we're going to talk about it. The Cubs rotation, the youngsters that are going to try to make an impact on this roster. What's going on with Cody Bellinger? Could the Cubs be in the mix for more than just Cody Bellinger? All of that coming up here on Friendly Confines Weekly on the Cubs Baseball Channel. Make sure that you guys like and subscribe, and let's get this thing started. Go Cubs! Hey, everybody, welcome to the Cubs Baseball Channel. There he is, the catfish himself, and that is Mr. Chad Anderson. I'm Mick Gillespie at Broadcaster Mick. Uh, Chad, good to see you. Uh, black, uh, blank background because yeah. some, some work going on in your house right now, but it's still uh, and, and a fresh haircut. Mick, Mick, I'm high as a kite right now. I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> this is the, these walls were uh the the color was called elephant gray oh nice those, those were the those were the colors because this is this is my office man cave studio lounge area like the whole deal there's so much over here that you guys obviously don't see we're doing a lot to the house and these walls are freshly painted and uh whew, there's a lot going on up in <laughs> up in here with with the fumes and the dust and uh it, it's quite a bit so yeah we're uh we're getting a different kind of high today hey there you go sniffing paint uh a lot of people <laughs> do the glue but whatever it takes right the uh, the permanent markers right yeah right. yeah yeah right well, welcome back to the show welcome back to the show let's talk some cubs baseball do it pitchers and catchers reported on valentine's day yeah. And it's exciting, man. I mean, it's just that time of year where you a, a guy a guy named Cal Ermer who was a longtime scout and a bunch of other jobs in baseball for the Twins and the Senators before that used to say hope springs eternal, right? <laughs> you know, and it's kind of that that's how we feel right now. It's like, hey, and we're going to win the World Series. There was also a line that said, hope is the name of a ship that sunk. So, <laughs> is, was it? I don't know. It's just some stupid saying I've seen on Twitter a couple of times is all. Uh, no, man, what a week. You know, this is kind of that time. And, you know, at least where we've been, weather's been kind of warmer. Um, it's been a pretty mild February. You got uh, just still the rumor mills and the rumblings. But then, yeah, seeing guys and just seeing like, you know, pictures and videos and guys out there on the field and just seeing the grass and the dirt. Um, this is such an exciting time. And it's one of those where, especially as Cubs fans, this year is really interesting because you still haven't signed some of those big, what you would call like holes or gaps in the lineup or places you're trying to, to get to. But at the same time, you've got all these young guys who have so much high potential and you know, could end up being on the big league roster. And, you know, it's just exciting to kind of see like how these guys play out and how they perform. And it's got to be a little different. I mean, make you spend more time than anybody uh, with these guys, like constantly with the Smokies and watching people come through the minors. Yeah. But there are years where you go into spring training and you know, you're not going to the big league club, you know, like you're just, you're at spring training. And that's like just no part of Casey the this year. Yeah, like yeah, you're Casey's not going to make the roster, but right, you're you're just part of this is this is just part of your journey this year's spring training. But then there are years where it's like th this is a year I need to like prove myself in spring training. Nicole? Like I need to have a good spring. I need yeah. to show out in spring, and that's one of those years for some of those players. PCA is one of them. So. I'm really excited, man. I mean, the next five, six weeks, four or five weeks, um, it's going to be a lot of fun to see what happens, not just with the free agency rumors. I think a lot of people are kind of getting tired of that. They but are. seeing what's going to happen with, with this club and like what Jed Hoyer says, like, hey, we're focused on the guys who are here right now. And I think that's, you know, something that's pretty exciting to watch. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I thought he did a good job in the press conference. He and, um, 
uh, Carter Hawkins, who I like a lot, the GM of the team, and then uh, you know Craig Council. And and look, Craig Council is trying to learn everyone's name. They're working on fundamentals. You know, there's a lot of a, a lot of change and new faces for him to learn. But at the same time, I I I love the idea of them crushing the fundamentals. And I'm not saying that that Rossi didn't do the same thing. But this is a great time of year to do that because it's the only time of year to to really do that at the big league level. And you know, in the minor leagues, you you're you're supposed to be constantly working on that. But you're right. You make you bring a, a great point. Pete Crow Armstrong is going to spring training when he gets there to try to take the center field job. Alexander Canario is going there to try to win the center field job, right? Mike Tockman's trying to fight these guys off in center field. Yep. Um, you know, I did a video the other day on first base. Um, Michael Bush, who is at first base right now, hasn't really played a lot of first base as a pro. I think he played it back in college, but he can play it. Scouts say he can play it. He's going to try to win that job. Matt Mervis is going to be like in the camp to prove that he belongs there because that's what competition does. Third base, same thing. You know, we don't know who the third baseman's going to be. I mean, you, you throw a bunch of guys up there, but it was kind of a platoon position. But you're right. You go to spring training and and there's guys that are there like PCA to win the job. And then there's guys like, Oh, and Casey, who are there just to make a good impression. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's it. And you, you mentioned some of those. Uh, you know, I, I see Bleacher Nation. Um, it's one of the great Cubs accounts. Yeah. It's on Twitter. I read one of their articles the other day, um, and it talked about, you know, different lineups, right-handed pitcher versus left-handed pitcher, and, and what you would expect to see, assuming that the Cubs roster on opening day is the exact roster that it is right this moment. Yeah. And and when you go back and look at some of that, um, there were some interesting spots. And it's very visible when you don't have Cody Bellinger. Because I think when, when the right-handed pitcher was on the mound, uh, you had Michael Bush in there as the big, the big left-handed bat at the three spot. And you had, you know, other people around him had Ian Happ in the leadoff spot just because of his ability to get on base last year. And then on the lefty side, you had Nico Horner in the leadoff spot. Happ was further down. Um, you had Morell in the cleanup spot. And it's, you know, if the Cubs are going to put him at third base, well, they could they could end up fooling a lot of people because he doesn't seem to be getting much uh, talk about the third base position. So then, you know, that leaves Nick Madrigal and Patrick Wisdom in there and right Patrick wisdom's a guy who when the lefties going you know he's in the he's in the lineup um madrigal you know what can he do and is he going to be able to to kind of break out you know there was a lot of hype and he had some flashes last year there was a lot of hype when the cubs got him from the white Sox. then you look over like you said at first base um everybody says michael bush morell's gonna play first or get some reps patrick wisdom at first base yeah and you said it just a minute ago. Matt Mervis is like, "Hey, what the hell? I'm still here." Like, yeah. you know, everybody everybody kind of wrote Mervis off um because yeah. Ross only gave him what like 18 innings. <laughs> it's like crazy. Um so yeah, it, there's some uh very very big question marks, but I don't know. Like the longer this drags out, it's almost like Cubs fans with what Jed and Carter were saying, you better get used to this being the roster for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mervis got a little bit of playing time, but you know, not enough to know if he can play or not. And, and guys have struggled in making that transition. One thing I, I do want to say though, and I, and I, we got to talk about this just because it is such a big story. The market for Cody Bellinger is playing right in the Jed Hoyer's hands. Now, that could change, and, and I know what Scott Boris is hoping is that something happens during spring training and maybe some dollars from a big-time franchise come available that, you know, because like somebody got hurt and they're going, well, you know what, maybe we need to make this happen. But the teams that Bellinger could possibly go to are coming out now and saying that well, they don't have any money. The Blue Jays, they just came out and said, hey, we're done spending. The Angels 
are like, well, we might get a pitcher, but you know, they're having problems financially and you know, and with the stuff going on with the stadium and the city. Yeah. They they want to spend less. The TV deal, and and some of you guys have said, you know, kind of explain this. Basically, linear TV is the TV that you turn on like cable TV, right? And yeah. when the these a lot of these contracts for baseball were put together, linear TV dominated the, you know, the way that you watched sports, right? You, you just turned the TV on. Now, linear TV is going this direction. And yep. you got apps, you know, like I watch every game on the MLB app, right? There are some blackouts, but, um, and I think that's how a lot of you guys do this, right? So the, the contracts that the regional sports networks bought were really expensive. And then advertisers are like, man, we don't, we're not going to buy this. I mean, you, you know, you're only getting a fraction of the audience now. That and I think part of it too is that baseball's popularity also, you know, in in some aspects went down. Now I think that the changes that they made, making the game faster, uh, I wish that the players would be a little bit more proactive when it comes to marketing the game, uh, which which is one of the things I, I think Cody Bellinger could do really well if he ends up coming back to the Cubs. Like I think he's going to. But anyway, the contracts were based off of like the money that these teams would get from the TV revenue. Well, now all of a sudden they're losing money there and it's kind of coming this direction. So the market's cut down. Let Less teams have money to spend. Now the Dodgers went out and spent a billion dollars, but their TV market and they're, they're kind of on a different thing. They have their own, you know, they, they have a great deal that is different than the other teams, right? And the Cubs are trying to get there with their network. The problem is, is that when they started it, this the slide was already happening, marquee, and it underperformed. And I think part of that was leadership, and there's leadership change now. So I think that that'll get that that'll improve. But at the end of the day, it's all about trying to figure out how to take advantage of the market that is in the future and not in the past. Linear TV is going to be something that we, you won't buy cable anymore. You'll probably just, you know, it'll be different. So with all of that said, and I, and I'm trying to kind of cut down a lot into a little here, um, there's just less money for teams to spend on free agents. So with that said, I would not be surprised because I think the Cubs do have money. They're just waiting for the deals that they want, that they get Bellinger. And then maybe they pounce on some other guys. I could see the Cubs, I could see the Cubs really doing some damage here between now and opening day just because there's no market. And I think they're one of the teams that actually has some money to spend. Yeah. The, the streaming market and it's such a great topic. Like you could do a two hour show yeah, just on streaming versus linear. And what Mick's talking about is he, the perfect example. I mean, it's cable linear tv meaning that you have a set schedule it's like radio programming where it goes 7 a.m to 8 a.m you have this show on and then 8 to 8 30 is this sitcom and then 8 30 to 9 is this talk show and 9 to 10 is this and 10 a.m is the price is right and you go on and on and that's that's linear tv and with the streaming services and like what mick is saying like you literally and this it's what this channel is you literally can pull anything up at any given time and watch anything um, on your phone, on your laptop, on your tablet. It doesn't even have to be on your TV anymore. And even if it's on your tablet, guess what? You can, you know, Chromecast or Apple TV, or you can push it to your television. If you wanted to put it on in the living room, there's now YouTube TV, which is like a hybrid, a little bit of like, uh, streaming and linear uh, kind of combined. It's where it took the two worlds and meshed them together. I think YouTube TV is the fourth largest quote unquote cable brand yeah. in the United States right now. So you can see where the push has come, but guess what YouTube also owns, you know, or what Google owns is YouTube. So it, <laughs> it like all wraps itself in and, and that's just it. And you see what happens if you don't provide viewers what they want. Because if you don't do that, look at what happened to all those regional sports networks. Yeah. You know, the, the, the Padres almost couldn't make payroll or they couldn't make payroll. They had to go get a loan. 
And then is it the Diamondbacks and the Guardians? I think it is. Were were two teams um, where the the networks like either didn't pay them or got behind on payments or filed bankruptcy. Um, it, it was. I, I'm pretty sure it was Guardians and maybe Diamondbacks as well. Um, but those those things were happening or are happening, and and it's cutting into to a lot of this and, and a lot of budgets and teams just saying, Hey, we don't have the money. And especially if you don't have the brand, that's why teams with brand are really, really uh, going to be able to succeed. And it may get extremely top heavy. The Dodgers are a brand. Right. They go all the way back to the days of Brooklyn. And they've been in Los Angeles since the 1950s. The Dodgers are a brand. The, and, and, and they even expanded more so with Yamamoto and Otani into Japan. So, and yeah. they've always kind of been a Japanese team as well. But now it started with Nomo, and you're right. Like, right. But now it's Japanese just, market. Right. There. Yeah. Now it's just crazy. Um, you know, kind of like the Mariners tapped into that a little bit with Ichiro. Yeah. The Yankees tried to tap into that with Hideki Matsui. Yeah. Um, it did okay, but it didn't pan the same way it's done for those West Coast teams that have a little bit better time zone for the Japanese market. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. A, and a big Japanese culture uh, in those yeah. state in California too, you know, like, correct. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's the closest, the first thing you hit when you come to America, yeah. you know, That's nearest, right. nearest state yeah. uh, versus flying an additional 2,500 miles to New York city. So all those things happen are happening. And man, I've said this on previous shows. I worry about major league baseball in a bubble. Because of these kinds of things, if you have teams literally coming out now and saying, love to have Cody Bellinger, can't afford him. I mean, we're talking about the Blue Jays, who are a playoff team mm -hmm. or, or a playoff contender. You're talking about the Angels, who aren't, but they're trying to get there. The Angels are overshadowed by the Dodgers. The Angels are screwed. Like, they're literally screwed. They're <laughs> overshadowed by the Dodgers. Yeah, You know, they're just, they're just not. You may say, well, what about the the A's and giants or the Mets and the, well, the A's right. moved. That's how well they did against the giants. And then you look at the Mets Yankees. That's a little bit different because the Mets also have such a long history in general. I know the angels been around for a little bit. Also, right. well, plus the Mets in New York, uh, people love the national league there because yeah, of the correct. giants and the Dodgers. So you know, New York, New York, such a big baseball town, but you're right, man. I mean, but you're going to run out of like teams are already saying we can't do this. They're looking at their budgets and they can't do it. And the biggest thing that happened to baseball happened outside of baseball. And that was digital content and digital yeah. streaming disrupted cable. Yeah. And once cable got disrupted, they didn't have the monopoly anymore. Yep. And that that really put a put a hurt on them. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. And and I and the Cubs have a brand too. And I think the Cubs have a brand that's they right do, there yeah. with the Dodgers, right there with the Yankees. And uh, the Giants and the Red Sox and the Red Sox, White Sox are not screwed. spending, right? The, but see, that's the, the White Sox are screwed because the Cubs overshadow their brand. Yeah. Nobody thinks Chicago and goes White Sox. No. Mm -mm. Chicago is a Cub city. Right. The White Sox have a small portion of the city. Yeah, right. Uh, and that's it. But the Cubs are the Chicago team. Right. And, and I think that I just got this feeling and I could be totally off base, but I think that if the, when the market hits where the Cubs feel like it should be, they sign Bellinger. And if it plays out where they could get maybe one of the pitchers, maybe, and, and, and it does hurt that they're both left-handers, right? But whatever. I mean, maybe you sign one of those guys and then you tr make a trade and you get somebody else. I, I feel like there's a real weakness at catcher right now. Uh, once you get past Jan Gomes, and uh, I, I mean, that's just my opinion, you know, uh, and I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that Amaya has a huge year because he is a great guy and he's got some tools. But it's, you know, Jan Gomes is, is, is an older guy. It's a, it's a tough position. It's a physical yeah. position. You know, so who knows where they're going to go. But the longer that this thing waits out, and I know that a lot of, uh, of, of Cubs fans are kind of like, hey, we want we want Bellinger back. I think we all do. I think the players want him back. You know, we want him back as fans. The market tells you you can't pay one of these ransom con contracts from Boris. You just got to wait, and then it's going to come down to okay, is he going to sign another one year deal and try to push it for 
Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden you look at the free agents that are available next season. You want to go up against them or do you drop it down to where it's like what the market tells you that a player is worth? Right. The Yankees, from what I'm hearing out of New York, they signed Marcus Stroman because the price for Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery was just too high. That's the Yankees. Yeah. 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 When if. If the Yankees and the Dodgers haven't yet, because they just went and spent over a billion dollars on two guys. <laughs> but if the Yankees and then if the Dodgers do in the new the near future, although the Dodgers sent off the flares by saying, hey, we're going to defer all this money yeah. for 20 years, you know, then that's just that's a huge red flag to me. Because yeah. where's the money going to come from? If your top two brands can't figure out where the money's going to come from. I'll tell you where it's going to come from, Mick. It's going to come from the hot dog being an extra dollar fifty. Yeah. The right. beer, the beer's twelve dollars, not nine. The the liquor is fifteen dollars for one shot, not double shots. <laughs> okay. Right. Like, right. Just, yeah, that, that's where it is. The jerseys go up 10 bucks. Yeah. The parking goes up five bucks. The the fans are the ones that ultimately pay to get priced out of this. Well, and that's always, man, I, this is, and I didn't know we were going to go there, but I, I will I tell you, man, this is one of the things, though, that bothers me the most about professional sports in general. I mean, I was a poor kid growing up, and thankfully, I get to go to games for free now, but it was such a big deal to go to a game, a, pro, a professional game as a kid, and my parents really couldn't afford us to go to I mean, it have to be like the real big discount Sundays and stuff, you know, right, and, yeah. and, and now like, you know, to take a, a, a family that's not upper and upper middle class and above. I mean, it's a lot of money, man. You you, you factor in the parking and the hot dog and you want to get a uh, you know, you want to get a souvenir. I mean, yep. it's 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 so expensive. And. With football, I don't know. I guess just because it's an easier game to play with the ball, and it's it's perfect for TV. You know, the just it, well, that game fewer. hasn't suffered from it as much. But baseball just feels like it's so expensive to play and to watch and to go in person um, that it that it kind of hurts the game a little bit. Football significantly cheaper though. Yeah, I mean, you're only you're you're playing once a week. You're you're not. I mean, you're playing once a week yeah. for what twenty. 3 24 weeks counting preseason and if you go to the Super Bowl or like in college if you make the playoffs or something I mean you're you're just not playing as much you also have double and triple the attendance of one baseball game packed into a football stadium right you know you got that um yeah it's less expensive you don't have footballs flying into the crowd that you don't get back you know you don't you don't have <laughs> yeah, right. all these different things happening um, right they're 25 like dollar balls yeah, right. Yeah, you don't have all that stuff happening uh, like you do in baseball. So it because, yeah, you got to have the field prepped every single day. You got to have uh, just all the vendors, all the people, all everything, just every single day. Um, and you do it 81 times at home, uh, whereas football, you're doing it at what, a tenth of that? Yeah, a little over a tenth of that, an eighth of that. So it's it's very, very different. I'm just curious from a, a not just a fan standpoint, but the business standpoint to see how these four Boris clients end up doing with their contracts. Talking about Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, the pitchers, and then obviously Cody Bellinger and Matt Chapman, the uh, the two position players. And I, and I feel like the Cubs are still in on both of those guys. Third base is would be such an easy position to do a one or two year deal with Chapman, give yourself some time to develop players and then put them in the spot. Maybe just a one year deal like that Bellinger had last year. And, and I, I, I still think that it's 75, 25 that eventually the Cubs and Boris work out a deal for Bellinger. Well, I, I have for no reason, by the way, like I'm not an insider guys. I don't have the connections. I'm not getting, the text messages before anybody else. I just have this gut that is saying it's going to be Bellinger is, is a cub. It almost feels inevitable. You yeah. know, it, it feels like, um, you ever know, like in middle school, high school, when 
there's this girl and you both like each other, but you won't talk to each other. <laughs> and then finally a friend comes over and is like, well, y'all just shut up and go out or something or go make out. You know, like that's yeah. what it feels like a little bit with the Cubs and Cody Bellinger. They both want to be on the same team, but neither one. Uh, and it could be all Boris, um, Boris and, and Hoyer and Hawkins just standing firm. They're like the parents. You know, the Cubs, yeah. the franchise, the Cubs and Bellinger are the two kids and and Boris and, and Hoyer and Hawkins are the parents or something. I don't know, but it's it's just one of those. I think it'll get done. But we've talked about this and kind of talked about our limits, right, on what we would want the Cubs to pay for Bellinger. And I'm in that like five year, six year, 150 ish million kind of camp. Like, yeah, yeah, right. that's where right. I want to be. All with right. Yeah, because if, if you get up to the 200 and stuff, well, then you're paying a guy $30 million who's, you know, 37, 38 years old. And he's just not going to be worth it. So you're you're overpaying now for something you got to pay for later. Um, I would love to see, you mentioned kind of the one-year deals and stuff. I, I would actually love, personally, if the Cubs just went in and signed a, a one- or two-year deal and paid him like $35 million a year. I don't think he would take that though. Or 40, 40, because if maybe that's a stretch, but my point is we've talked about next year's free agency class. Yeah. And if you want to have the flexibility in that class, then overpay for a year, two years and, and move on and see if somebody would do that. I know like that's why Stroman opted out, right. Was to get the longer contract that guaranteed more money for longer. Yeah, and even though, yeah, even though he, he didn't even got, do that well, but yeah, right, correct. So if you look at some of these, some of these names that are coming up for next year, Juan Soto's at the top of the list. That's going to be the Otani signing for next year, right. you know, is Soto. But then you got Teoscar Hernandez, you got Conforto, Ozuna, Haniger, Kana, Blackman, uh, Harrison Bader, Kiermaier. Margot, hey, your boy Jason Hayward's unrestricted next year. Uh, <laughs> guy, I but, like, he is a great guy. He's just, he, he's an amazing guy. He, he just, just is soft pop up the second base or the four three ground out. You yeah, know, and I hate to say that, but that's what it really was for years with him. And that's just that's just the outfield. So you you put in all positions. You got Garrett Cole, Paul Goldschmidt, Zach Wheeler, yeah. Patrick Corbin. Pete Alonzo, Alex Bregman, Charlie Morton, Riz is a free agent again next year. Oh, I mean, yeah. he's getting old, but you know, there's just a oh, lot man. of guys next year, a lot of names um, that could be floating around next year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had to talk about it. I just think that the Cubs are in position because the Angels are saying that they've got a money issue. The Giants signed Solaire. That tells you that they're not going to sign Bellinger now. The, yeah. um, the Blue Jays are saying they're done spending which I kind of had that feeling and it's like, where else are you going to go? Right. And, and that's, that's all there. And, and it doesn't just apply to, to Bellinger that applies to Chapman. And then all of a sudden you look at the pitchers too. I don't, and I don't know if the Cubs are interested in adding one of those guys or not, but I'm sure if you got the right deal and the fact that they have the money, don't be surprised if they don't pull off something. And then besides that, I mean, the the one thing that I will say about what Jed's done this off season is to expect the unexpected, you know, but he's not going to just make a deal based off of, um, and maybe I have blind faith, but I, I really see the direction of the organization. And I, I think that they're taking it in the right direction. Um, I, I like, I like, I said this on uh, so many shows being around this for 20 years after the world series, there was an organizational issue with elitism and that's a bad thing, you know, and, and it's, and you got to get out of that and entitlement. Those two E's right there are the reason why the Cubs are where they are. And then I look at the Astros who I felt like the Cubs were going to be like the Astros constantly competing for championships. Jealous of the Astros. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I, and I think we're going in that direction again. The other thing is like, you, you know, you make these signings, you don't want to take opportunities away from the young players. And we talked about it. Pete Crow Armstrong, who uh, I call Hollywood Pete. I cannot wait. I heard that he is busting it in, 
uh, and he's been in Arizona working with the, the 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 Cubs out there, the hitting guys, changing his swing. The guy's super competitive. He's very good. And I think that he's going to make a huge impact eventually. Uh, and, and Alexander Canario, the same thing. You get, those guys are going to be fighting it out. And what's going to happen is they're going to end up taking playing time away from Hap and away from, say, a Suzuki, because I think they're going to be good enough where you got to put them on the field. Uh, and, that, or it could be in the DH spot, too. The Cubs, I mean, this isn't realistic, but they're almost in a position where the Cubs are like this team where the whole roster is platooning with each other. Yeah. You know, you don't have your normal uh, 13 position players where you've got uh, this many guys playing uh, every single day. And then you got three or four bench guys mm -hmm. uh, who are just notorious bench players or specialists, you know, like a uh, Terrence Gore was when he would steal all the bases for the Cubs and yeah. their, their contention years. You, know, you don't have that. Um, it, this is a, a literally a team where you could almost be a little, and I hate to be negative, but detrimental to yourself. Could you not? Because yeah. if, if you're sitting here, how do you ever get in a groove if you're constantly being brought in and out of a lineup or you're always brought in in the fourth inning or you sit one day, but then the next day is the seventh inning. And then the next day you're off completely. And then you play a full game again. And then it's like, it's really hard, you know, to kind of stay in rhythm and keep momentum going in those positions. And the Cubs, like you said, they got guys who are going to challenge the starters and that's where it's going to be difficult for council and for the front office. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, a, it's, that's as interesting. And it's something that we'll continue to cover here on the Cubs baseball channel. We got to talk about it though, because yeah, it, it is a, this is a major story. It's one of the biggest stories in baseball right now. What happens with Cody Bellinger, Matt Chapman, as the Cubs move forward. But you mentioned it, and let's talk about it. As the roster sits right now, the most intriguing battle probably to me is going to be Matt, uh, Michael Bush, how he and Matt Mervis go at it at first base. I think it's Bush's position to uh, to win or lose. And, yeah. and he may get the position no matter what happens because they, 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 they you know, they've got him from the Dodgers and they paid a high price for him. You mentioned third base. The other thing to me is what about the starting rotation? Are there openings in this rotation? Because Jamison Tyon, well, let me just go through it like this. Jordan, um, we'll start with uh, Justin Steele, right? Be your one. And then who would be your two? Jamison Tyon is because of the money. Well, I, I would think. Is Imanaga. Imanaga. Yeah, but I don't know if you go lefty. Hendricks lefty. four. Well, just how this throw it. Just all right. Let's not do that. Let's just throw them out there. Then. Okay, you got you got Steel, Imanaga, yeah. Tyon, Hendricks, and then for the fifth spot, I mean, it, you would think it'd be Wicks, but could be Assad. Yeah. You know, is is Smiley going to be fighting for that again? Smiley. Yeah. Uh, don't don't rule out Wesneski either. Um, you know he he was the one that got the five spot last year and it didn't pan out. Right. And and he got demoted uh pretty quick into the season. But he's still a guy that has shown the capability. So longer shot, but I still think you throw his name in there. But yes, Wicks, Smiley, Assad, and then I would say Wesneski also. Ben Brown, you know, this is the year where you're expecting Ben Brown to be in the big leagues. You know, spent all last year in triple A, would have been called up had it not been for an injury, I think it was an oblique or something, but it wasn't an arm injury. Um, and I, I should probably Google that. But no matter what it was, it wasn't anything that affected his arm. You expect him to be there. And then could Cade Horton go to spring training and impress? I mean, it would not be the first time that a double-A pitcher got to the big leagues, went through camp, impressed everyone, and ended up with a role on the staff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would be interesting. I mean, the Cubs just have such an embarrassment of riches when it comes to guys who can play on the team at the big league level, you mm -hmm. know, or, or at least be good enough to have a shot to prove themselves at the big league level. And how crazy would that be if Cade Horton got into it this year? And I mean, he's good enough. He, right. But I mean, just with 
and I hate saying this because when it comes to sports, like I really hate the whole, they serve their time. You have to let them play. Screw that. Like if somebody's better, the better person should play. Yeah. It, it's really that simple. So the key is how do you figure out if Cade Horton's better, right? Like or better at this moment, maybe in five years, he's the ace and there's no questions asked, but how do you figure out if he's better based on today than someone else? But um, I really hope he gets a shot this year or, or at least a look, you know, bring him up yeah. in, in May or June and say, let's, let's see what he's got because he's also another piece that can be so good. You got to remember if the Cubs want to be a contender and, and they should be this year, but if yeah. they want to be a contender, you have to figure out, Mick, a lot of these question marks in May and June. Because by July, you're making a move. You're figuring out and positioning yourself for the final 60 days of the season. So some of these guys have to be given opportunities and have to be called up or have to be put in more so, you know, more often than maybe they have in the past or than you expected. Because you got to know, what do I got? What do I got? Because you can't be playing trial and error in August or at the end right. of July when the trade deadline's happening and you're trying to place yourself in position to win a division. Yeah. Well, it, and it was a good sign last year for this organization to have, you know, a guy like Jordan Wicks make an impact at the end of the yeah. year. And, 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 and because they had gone so many years without any pitchers making an impact. Yeah. But they've got to follow that up. I mean, you got Steele, you, you, you know, who came from the organization. Wicks, obviously, Assad, and then Brown, they traded, but they did pretty much develop him. It was like a, a double-A pitcher when they got him from the Phillies. Yep. And so you're right. There's a, there's a lot of questions. And then I, I'm telling you right now that Cade Horton is the best of the bunch. It's just a matter of him staying healthy. Yeah. He's the most exciting guy. I, I love the I love a pitcher who's not afraid to pitch inside, who's who's a little bit mean, who is who and then he's got that amazing slider and he can locate that all over the place. But um, you know, and there's wicks on there. So that's a that's a good sign for the Cubs. And then you look at the bullpen, and and I'll tell you what, Luke Little is so important because they didn't go out and sign a left-handed reliever, which <laughs> which is crazy yeah. because they got a whole rotation of lefties. Hey, you know what I love going back to Wicks for a quick second? I love the fact that his pitch is the changeup. Yes. You know, just you don't see it anymore. You know, like all people talk about is how nasty somebody's fastball moves or how they throw 99. Yeah, right. You know, how, how often do you well. hear hard throwing right hander? Like that's the most common phrase ever in Major League Baseball when it comes to talking about a pitcher, hard throwing right hander. I it's just annoying, so overbearing. You hear it all the time. So I I love just you mentioning Wicks and talking about him in the rotation. Just to reiterate that and point that back out to our our fans, viewers. You know, just Jordan Wicks. One thing I just love is a guy comes in and gets people out with a changeup. Yeah, classic. Well, and it's a it's a great pitch to have as one of your best pitches. Too. <clears throat> yeah. Because it, like look at Kyle Hendricks. I mean, great changer. Yeah. Able to change speeds, keep guys off balance. But you're right. It's so whose slider has the 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 most uh the best spin rate, velo. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it's all about getting out. It's it's not necessarily what all these analytics are. They're important. They don't tell the whole story, though. So Correct. Yep. But I'm, right. I'm curious to see kind of how things progress with that bullpen. I just don't think that what we have right now is what we're going to have when the, the regular season starts. And I think it's going to be like when you least expect it, they're going to start signing guys. Or they could make a trade, and I I don't put them out on wheeling and dealing. You know, teams like Cleveland got their payroll based off of the TV. Now they don't have that money. They'd love to cut spending. They've got some players that you'd love to have. Yeah. Uh, and if they don't get Bellinger, maybe they make a trade to to 
fill that spot. It is interesting that you know Bieber's name continues to come up like under the radar, though. Um, there was an article as well recently, and you can tell it's funny because you get to a point where everybody's tired of talking about the same thing. So they start writing variations of their previous articles because that's where we're at right now. Because think about it, Mick, you and I, it's been over two months since you and I sat in Nashville at the Gaylord Opryland Hotel and Convention Center. Wow. And we still don't know anything. Yeah. Like, like the Cubs still yeah. haven't really done a whole lot. Um, just a few things here and there, but you know, nothing, nothing really crazy or whatnot. So um, some more minor ish type signings. And it's just funny how that works, how that plays out. But the article I saw the other day was, you know, it started leaking into the should, uh, should Blake Snell sign a two year deal? Yeah. Which is what we said earlier about Cody Bellinger. Like at what point do you just start saying, Hey, maybe I should just sign a two year deal, one year deal, and then get the big check later. Um, but going back to that money thing, you know, I don't know that again, how long big checks can keep happening. Yeah. So it's it's just an interesting situation. I don't know if you call it a problem, but you're you're in this limbo, you know, this dilemma between both sides of wanting the checks, wanting the contracts, and people kind of hesitant right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's you're going to spend big money. It's just how big is the money, and it, <sighs> there's really not an endless well of cash. And if, and because what's going to happen, and you mentioned it before, if you think that they're going to take a loss because of those contracts, they're not. What's going to happen is that when you go to sit at Wrigley, you're going to be paying $20 for a beer yeah. instead of 12, right? Yeah. You're going to be paying $20 for a hot dog instead of eight or whatever it is. You know, like the, 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 the contract's going to be passed off to the fan. And now, with that said, if a guy is performing, if if they sign Bellinger, say, and, he, and, and eight years from now he was still performing, no one would care. But right. it's when you get Hayward and you're paying him and he's grounding out and popping up weekly to second every time up, it looks like he's really not interested in, you know, eh, whatever. And now all of a sudden he goes to L.A. and he's a good player again. But he's on one-year yeah. contract. <laughs> I mean, what, I, I don't, I don't get that. But I guess if your get, money's guaranteed, hey, I ground it out the second. <laughs> you know, there's just there's I very very you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I get it. There, but the a lot of that too. A lot of that too, though, and and I get it. But a lot of it's not intentional. Um, I don't think players of this caliber and players of this uh, competitive nature. I just find it hard to believe that they look at it and get the money and then just chill um, because they still want to win championships. In my opinion, they do. Um, I think as humans, naturally, we just get comfortable. If if somebody says, hey, you know, you, you're, you're good as far as money goes, um, there, there's not the same amount of pressure as there is when you're a rookie and you're trying to get the big contract and it's just not. And if that bleeds over, I don't think any of it's intentional. I just think there's very, very, very few people in this world who can be given everything. And I'm talking about everything monetarily and be able to continue to have the switch flipped at full throttle. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's hard no matter what, no matter how competitive you are, no matter what kind of person you are, that's just difficult to do, um, to constantly want to win. Kind of like the same thing of why you very rarely see teams don't win back-to-back championships yeah, or individuals don't win back-to-back awards. Like that's why, you know, love him or hate him, Tom Brady, you know, greatest quarterback, Patrick Mahomes just won his third Super Bowl. Right. You know, they both have endless amounts of money. Think of everything Tiger Woods accomplished. Right. In his career, you know, he's still playing. Why is Tiger Woods still playing? Why is Tiger Woods playing eight events this year? Yeah. He's got everything. Like, he's literally there. You really think he cares about the prize pool? 
Yeah. <laughs> like, he doesn't care. Loves the game. Loves the game. He loves the game. He just wants to win. Yeah. But that's what I mean. Like it's those, that very, very small handful of people are able to do that. Yeah. Everybody else. It's just tough, man. It's tough mentally to not be a little more content and happy with your life. Yeah. You know, one guy we never talk about is Ian Happ. Here's a gold glover. Uh, I think people were, I, I honestly, I feel like he was just put into a tough position last year, being the third batter in the lineup. I don't think he's a three hole guy every time. I mean, <laughs> I, sometimes he is, but, but you know, you look at his numbers and the contributions that he makes for the Cubs to get to the postseason. I think they need a good season, a really good year out of Ian Happ. Well, I think our problem, I don't want to say problem, like Ian's a good player. He, you know, he's quality player. Um, if you look and find and hunt for certain analytics and stats, like he's actually a top 25 in some key categories and, and top 50 in all of baseball and others. Right. I think a lot of Cubs fans, and I'm very guilty of this, you just more look at the lineup and you go, that's our three guy? Like, it's just one of those like, man, I don't see where anything he does is like, overwhelmingly spectacular like he's just kind of there and he's good enough and he's got some awards and there are certain like i said stats where he's solid and right. top whatever but but there's just nothing like i don't know of an opponent that looks at him and gets nervous and i guess that's my problem with him being in the three hole you know if he's in the one slot in the leadoff spot against left hand or right-handed pitching and he's yeah. on base at a 380 clip hell yeah throw him in there I love that guy. Right. But when he's the three hole, I think that's what it was more for me. Is like just that frustration of like, that's our three guy. And, and I just think the Cubs could and should have better um, in that spot. And that's again, comes back to Cody Bellinger, but we'll right. see what happens. Yep. 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 Say a Suzuki. He's yep. going to be another year uh, with experience. I thought that he really came along last so season yeah. right and so it's it's exciting to have him back yeah. maybe he and and then also you know having imanaga i think it's going to help both guys just to have somebody else that you can talk to you know being a, if yeah, that means, be like if think of us two we're on a you know a team in japan and you, you yeah. there by yourself you're like man i don't have anybody to talk to <laughs> yeah one stuff yeah. i want to say like how does that you know translate but then if you got somebody right. else there it's like hey man you know like so yeah. I, I got a feeling that that's going to help him a lot as well. No, I agree. I agree. That the, the culture thing does play into it. I mean, you can't tell me that Yamamoto didn't like the fact that Otani was already there, you know, and look at that and say like, man, that kind of helps me out. It's a little bit of a deciding factor for me. Yeah, him. it is. Yeah. So that's where we are right now. And then, uh, you know, games are going to start cranking up soon. The whole roster is going to be there soon. You know, by the time we get back together for our show next Saturday, I mean, you're you're talking about full swing spring training, yeah. which is I so know. exciting, man. I mean, like, you know, the it's just this is a great time of year. Um, just just everything about it's fun, you know. And the, what's so crazy about this, though, it, you know, not to get into it again, but it's just. It, it, I don't ever remember a season and people were like, what about when 2016, when, um, you know, it, it looked like, um, the center fielder, help me out. 2016 Dexter Fowler, Dexter Fowler. It looked like Dexter Fowler was going to sign with Baltimore. Yeah. And all of a sudden, and it was reported like he signed yeah. with Baltimore and then he, he, I'm, he showed up. I'm there. Yeah. He, here he comes. He walks by, and you're like, okay. And the the guys saw him, and they're like, oh, you know, whatever. And then Theo's like, hey, he's back. That season, everything that happened that year was like a movie. That was kind of like part of that movie. And then having yeah. him in the leadoff spot was great. So maybe something like that could transpire again. But it feels like even though that happened – in 2016 the rest of everything else was i to me it was kind of set in stone right this yeah. year it feels like they could add a third baseman they could add a first baseman center fielder dh they could add another pitcher they could make a trade yeah. 
I, I would not be surprised if Christopher Morrell doesn't get traded. I really just, it's just a gut feeling, but I could see that happening. And because there's value there and he doesn't really have a position. Yeah. I mean, for sure could happen. I mean, Morrell, he was talked about back in November. Yeah. And, you know, just, you can't tell me that he wasn't quote unquote trade bait back in November. And now all of a sudden, just because we're in February, he's not, I mean, the, the thing that you go to the Patriots and, and Bill Belichick, no matter what, decision was made the decision was always made based on the team yeah not an individual right so same thing here with morell i love morell i love the energy I love the electricity he brings to to a stadium to the lineup um he's got a really good bat he's gotten better um he's more controlled more disciplined at the plate defense still needs some work um but overall great young player so he's one of those like hey if we trade him I think I would be excited because only the reason of we should get a really good return for Christopher Morrell. I wouldn't be excited because Morrell's leaving. I'm excited because anybody who gets Morrell is going to have to give up quite a bit in return. But at the same time, if you keep a guy like Christopher Morrell, then guess what? It's great because that's a good person in the lineup. Like, there's nothing wrong with having him in the middle of the lineup. Yeah. Uh, so to me, and I'm, I'm with you, I feel like the same way it could go either way, but I'm also in the position with him. Like I'm good either way. Yeah. Because if he does go, then I know that it's going to be one of those where the Cubs get a really good return. Yeah. I'm, I agree. Yeah. And maybe that's a closer. Maybe that's a starter. Maybe that's a first baseman, which they, I think they have one now with Bush, but who knows? I mean, it just, yeah. It feels like there's still good uncertainty, and meaning that they're not satisfied. Think about if you're a fan of the Angels and they're like throwing their hands up, like, "Well, we just don't have any money." You know, we're gonna be, we're really gonna cut back on spend, or the or the Red Sox. We're like, "Well, we just traded Chris Sale, and we we want to get we want to get thinner and leaner." The Cubs aren't saying that at all. What the Cubs are saying is that we want the right deal. We're not going to overpay. We, we're not being held ransom by a guy with a mask on. You know, we're, we're, we want a deal that is either that's fair for both sides. And what we have seen is that Jed's all about having incentives in the contract that are based on performance. And I think that is brilliant because of going back to Hayward. It seems like when there's incentives there, he puts up pretty good numbers. Yeah. The year before the Cubs signed him, fantastic. Cubs Great signed him, St. Louis. Yeah. A lot of bad years in there. Now he goes to the Dodgers, and actually the guy had a really good season, and he'll probably have another one, you know, yeah. for whatever reason, right? The yeah. sense of urgency, maybe having a little bit of discomfort isn't a bad thing when you're trying to get the best out of some of your players. I don't know. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. Um that's always, I mean, it's it's a known thing. That's why people talk about contract years. That's yep. why contract years are are part of discussion. That's why it's described when you talk about a player. Oh, they're going into a contract yeah. year. They mm -hmm. only say that because they expect them to outperform their normal average. That's, yeah. That's the whole reason the term exists. A contract year equals expectation to overperform. Yep. And that's the only reason I've said it with Hector Neris is it makes me nervous. Because you sign a guy coming off of his best year. And so it's like, hey, I think it's a great addition to the bullpen. Yeah, I'm not I, nervous, by the way. Yeah, no, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not that. Yeah, I There's know. A v. There's no V. <laughs> no, I know. I don't know why. I did that. But everybody <laughs> yeah. let me know, and I apologize. So. Yeah. No. no I, got pretty got yeah. it down now. Wait. <laughs> you got it in time for spring training. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. For opening day. But that's uh, the only and, time I get nervous. Yeah. Is something like that. You know, when you sign somebody coming off their best year, that, that just has me a little on edge. Yeah. I'm with you. All right. Final question for you and on the show today, which is always yeah. fun getting together for friendly confines weekly. You're most excited about what with the Cubs? Uh, seeing which young players separate themselves you know, in the spring and how they perform. Cause this is a little bit of pressure for them too. You know, if, if you're a young player, 
and you're sick and tired of sitting in double A or triple A, then you want your chance at the show. I mean, this is it. You you got a four week window, right? To really prove yourself um, to the front office and to Craig Council. So I'm I'm really excited just to kind of see the competition. I think competition this year at Cub Spring Training is going to be a lot higher than in recent previous years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm really excited just to see how that pans out and how some of the guys perform and um what they do with the one month that they're that they're given. And you also have to remember as fans. Just because somebody has a great spring doesn't automatically equal a big league spot on opening day. Okay. Like keep that in check because they may say, look, this has been phenomenal. You're coming up soon. Don't worry. But the first few weeks, you got to start here. We just want one or two things worked on and then you're coming. But that's, that's more it, you know, is seeing which ones can live up to that kind of pressure because it is, it's internal pressure to work your way into that big league spot. For me, I'm excited about Hollywood Pete. When he gets comfortable, when he's not pressing, when he just starts playing his game, yep. and the level of his play meets the level of Major League Baseball, and everyone that hasn't seen him realizes what he brings to the table. Yep. The excitement, the his ability to play in the clutch, the great glove, the attitude that he plays with, the fire, the ter- the ter- determination, really like him. Really do. We did an interview on the channel with him, uh, you know, and you guys can go back and watch it a while ago. But still, I love him, and I can't wait to see what he does. I think this is going to be exciting. He could have one of those springs because I'm waiting for it to happen. It's going to happen. I know that we saw Javi Baez have, that we saw Chris Bryant have, where they just, they're just they just so hungry and determined that they just bust out. Yeah. And you remember that. Chris Bryant, like, dominating spring training, and they still put him in the minor leagues because <laughs> they had to for 11 days. He's got to go work on his defense, right? Even though he was the best player on the team at the time. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. fun. Now yeah. there's an incentive. You know, there's an incentive now – that if if you that you get an additional draft pick, if Pete Crow Armstrong, I think he I think he's one of these guys that can do this. If he comes up and has like you know like a MVP type season, you get an additional draft pick, which is crazy. That's a whole nother show, but it's it's pretty cool that it's there's an incentive to play young players and see them succeed. It's cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. I miss that. One. I I didn't miss the uh, Chris Bryant drama because I remember. <laughs> I remember all that going on and yeah. you know that that's just the business side of baseball is, yeah. is all that is that's the only way to explain it one of my best ever uh play-by-play highlights was um game cubs were playing when all of those guys were in the minor leagues a uh, spring training game in good year against cleveland and i want i, I i'm not going to get the order right but it was Baez, Bryant, and Solaire went back to back to back. And I was on the call for it. And I listened to the MLB radio and TV and like, you know, like all that, this stuff is so cool to have my calls like out there when that moment was happening. And people kind of remind me of that. Although I think right now the, um, the highlight of my play by play career, unfortunately, is when well not I shouldn't say unfortunately but I would say if you said what was the most famous moment it was when I called the action Will Farrell joined the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, yeah, like they helicoptered him in. Here he comes running in, and I'm uh, on the call for it. You know, that was great. Yeah, that was awesome. working with Len, and Len wasn't really sure what to make of it beforehand. <laughs> you know, because Will was going to play for both teams. It was part of a TV show. You know. And when it was over, he was like, that was awesome. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just won, won us all over. You know, he's like, he I want to say that he, he in that game, he was coaching a third base and just doing funny stuff. Anyway, well, that does it for the show. Uh, Chad, let me give you a chance before we get out of here. Well, let me, let me first say this, that we're proudly presented by the uh, Smokies team store. And you can find them at smokiesbaseball.com backslash store. They got all this new gear in. You're a Cubs fan. They've got Cubs gear. They've got championship gear. They won their first championship in 45 years. 
They also have autograph items. They have a card store. A lot of the uh, players wore jerseys that are signed as well. You know, like guys like Pete Crow Armstrong and Owen Casey. So, Kate Horton, check it out for yourself. Now, not la- last but not least, <laughs> ChadwickAnderson.com slash catfish. Yeah, just um, we we've come to the idea that we're not going to call it catfish mortgage as much as some people want to, because that <laughs> <laughs> worst mortgage name of all time would be catfish <laughs> mortgage. I'd love it. Though. I mean, it would it well, would I be awesome. Catfish mortgage. You you got me my house in my studio. So. It, it would be awesome as long as people understood the, the whole thing behind it. If you know us, it's great. If you don't, then that could that's where it gets bad. Uh, no, the housing market has actually been super strong, even with inflation and interest rates since the beginning of the year. And we've had a lot of people, too, refinancing and taking money out and paying off debt. Country, the United States, and over a trillion dollars of credit card debt, Mick. A trillion. Like You could buy, what, 100 Otanis for that? Yeah. I don't even know what the number is. <laughs> you could have a, a the National League filled with Otanis um, with that amount of money. But we've helped a lot of families. So on the refi side, saving um, three, four, five hundred dollars a month, one family, three thousand dollars a month, um, helping people with purchasing and buying a home. We've helped some people with investing and converting them um, you know, into real estate investors with keeping other properties and having rental income and all these great things. So if you just want to have a conversation um, of any sort, please reach out scan the QR code there. That's my personal cell phone and email. And I would love to chat or help or whatever you'd like to do. All right. Great hanging out with you guys. Again, uh, Friendly Confines Weekly. We'll get, the, get blah, blah, blah. we'll get back together again on Saturday to talk everything Cubs baseball. A little longer than our normal shows. So for uh, Catfish, Mr. Chad Anderson, I'm Mick Gillespie. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys, and go Cubs. 